Well, hello there. Welcome to my home in Cedar Hill, Washington, D.C. Sometimes I like to sit out here on my porch and recollect on my past. Lately, I've been called a servant leader by many people, but I don't really know much about that. I guess, though, the more I think about it, I did possess some servant leadership type qualities. After all, I was a servant to many masters for a good part of my life. I reckon I was an authentic man, though. I really knew myself and was my true self my whole life. Early on, even from a young age, I always had a sense of me that I would not be a slave my whole life. After seeing how slavery hurt many black folk and how it hardened the hearts of many white people, I valued what freedom was and I had a passion in my heart to achieve it, even if it meant risking my whole life. To gain my freedom, I guess you could say I had to be pretty vulnerable. You see, one day, I overheard my master, Mr. Old, scolding his wife for teaching me the alphabet. He proclaimed it was foolish to teach a colored man how to read because it would only make me rebellious and angry. From this moment, I became aware to the freedom of which comes with an education. I was anxious to learn, but now that Mrs. Old would no longer teach me, to read, I had to rack up the courage to ask some of the poor neighbor boys down in the shipyard to teach me. Me and those boys actually became quite good friends, and by opening up to them, they actually admitted to me how unfair they thought it was that I was trapped within slavery. I did not know it at the time, but these encounters with these boys were my first steps into philosophical and political enlightenment. By helping me learn to read and write, those boys enabled me to become the leader I am today. Shortly after learning how to read, I came across a book called The Columbian Orator. It educated me on the illogical motives of slavery and the manipulation of white people had on us Negroes. I reckon it was the book that inspired me to become an abolitionist. This was a turning point in my life, and from then on, I was determined to escape the institution of slavery. Anyways, while growing up, I also saw a lot of fiendish and barbaric behavior. While under my master, Mr. Go, I witnessed him murder my friend Demby for running into a stream next to our plantation and not coming out. He counted to three, and Demby stood there, frozen in fright. Mr. Gore ended his life right then and there with a rifle. Poor Demby, God rest his soul. Even I was a victim of such erroneous acts. My third master, Mr. Covey, beat me for not being able to control his unbroken oxen. He even kicked me in the head until I bled for fainting of exhaustion while working in the fields. I hated the way my masters treated me and my fellow Negroes, but I eventually accepted and understood them for who they were. I know society had taught them to treat me in that manner, and that they were just as much a victim of evilness of slavery as I was. Oh, how I hope the Lord has pity on them. After receiving the kicks in the head from Mr. Covey, I got up and ran off into the woods. I walked seven miles back to my previous master's home and pleaded with him to release me from Mr. Covey's barbarity. He told me he would not and to return to Mr. Covey's plantation. As I returned the next day, I was working in the barn. Mr. Covey sneaked up on me, tried to tie up my legs. At that very moment, I was fully aware of my own feelings and I knew I had enough of his beatings. I decided I would fight back, and I grabbed Mr. Covey by the throat. Covey called out to another slave named Hughes for help, but when he came into the barn, I gave him a heavy kick under the ribs, which left him gasping for air. From there on, Mr. Covey and I fought for nearly two hours. In the end, I considered him as getting the worst of it, for he had drawn no blood from me, but I had of him. For the next six months that year, Mr. Covey never did lay a hand on me again. That story really is one of my favorites to tell. It reignited the passion to reach freedom, which I did eventually reach in 1838. From there on out, I began to use my life as a resource to others, telling everyone who would listen about the atrocities of slavery. 
I attended my first abolitionist meeting in 1841 and soon became a regular speaker there. In 1845, I published a narrative of my life. And in 1847, I was producing my own anti-slavery newspaper called The North Star. I live quite an eventful life, and I am truly thankful for the grace God has given me to help lead my fellow brothers and sisters out of slavery. I surely do hope that one day men and women of any color can be treated exactly the same and obtain the same opportunities in life. For we are all human beings and deserve our God-given rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness.